Hello, Booktube. Recently, on Sunday, a day that's supposed to be blessed, a day that's supposed to be a day of rest, Michael K. Vaughn over on his channel made a video. I'll leave a link to it down below. The title of it will chill your blood. The title of it was, Do We Even Need Book Critics? I watched the video with chilled blood myself because I am a book critic. <laughs> I am one of the very few professional book critics who does literally nothing else. I think you can count them on the fingers of one hand. I don't have a teaching gig. I don't have a spouse with a job. I don't have uh, emoluments from a book. I don't have a side gig of any kind. All I do is review books. Uh, once upon a time, there were at least 100 people like that in, the, in America alone. Now, I don't think there are many. <laughs> And it was that small cadre of remaining professional book critics uh, that were the focus of this video. Do we even need book critics? I jotted down some notes on the iPad here so that I wouldn't simply rail. I will leave a link to Michael's video, but he asked the question, do we even need professional book critics, especially when they are so often wrong? Now, I'm not going to digress here. I'm not going to stoop to his uh, claim that I, myself, am always wrong. <laughs> that claim clearly flies in the face of one of the prime tenets of this channel, and therefore all of BookTube, that tenet being Steve is always right. Those two things can't both be true. <laughs> I'm not going to stoop to that level. Instead, I'm going to dig into the, video, the video's contents which were grouped around three writers. Michael K. Vaughan wants to point out three writers about whom critics were completely wrong. And the first one of those, naturally, if you know his channel, the first one of those is H.P. Lovecraft. He mentions that, uh, that H.P. Lovecraft, that his writing drew a lot of criticism even in his own day and has continued to draw criticism ever since. I don't know if this was a veiled glance at the fact that Lovecraft just doesn't do it for me. Notice I have never criticized his prose. I've only said he doesn't work for me. I'm not exactly a shrinking violet when it comes to saying that authors are bad, as you're going to see in the course of this video. I've never actually said that about H.P. Lovecraft. I've just said that despite his legions of fans and despite the legions of pastiches that have come out since then, despite the fact that Lovecraftian is an adjective in the literary world, I have never been captured in that way. I've been captured by a lot of his direct contemporaries and a lot of the people who influenced him, but not by him. But Michael K. Vaughan brings him up as the first example of an, a writer about whom critics got everything wrong. Because, as he puts it, H.P. Lovecraft has stood the test of time, and therefore he is a great writer. I think there's an allusion made to the fact that H.P. Lovecraft is in the Penguin Classic line. I would point out that The Mysteries of Paris by Eugenie Sue is also in the Penguin Classic line. No one's going to call that great writing. There's plenty of stuff in the Penguin Classic line that is in there because it is not so much great writing as some sort of fixture in the literary landscape, in the literary tradition. H.P. Lovecraft is certainly that. But... I, I want to make a glancing point here. I'll make this more in my summation to the jury. But I want to point out here uh, that it's, it's a misreading of the professional critic's role to say that they are guessing which authors are going to stand the test of time. The test of time is completely fickle. There is no way. And it's it, the professional book critics who say this will certainly be read in a thousand years. They're risking everything on a very dodgy bet. That's usually just shorthand for them saying, I think this should be read in a thousand years. Professional book critics are not predicting the future. And I wish that that were sort of stamped over the doorway of our clubhouse because you've got so many of those little uh, impulse buy books saying with collections of hilariously wrong reviews about books that later went on to become venerated. Uh, this is an example, I think, that's in Michael K. Vaughn's mind of that kind of critical failing. Of, of a critic being wrong. His next example uh, is Nelson Nye, a prolific Western author uh, who I think is one of Michael K. Vaughan's favorite Western authors and who I read a couple of his books for the event that Michael K. Vaughan created, uh, June on the Range, here on BookTube. It was a totally successful event. Everybody's loving it. Uh, I read two Nelson Nye novels uh, for that event just recently, and I didn't like 
either one of them. I thought they were both really bad. Uh, and uh, in this video, Michael K. Vaughan reads a passage from Nelson Nye that is along the lines of the thing that I, the kind of thing that I was criticizing. Uh, it's the only author, he's the only author that he reads from, and he, uh, he makes two contentions about that passage. One really, really got to me, really got under my skin, uh, it would, prompted me to make a video of its own on the subject for June on the Range, and that is that I was being an unfair critic because I was judging an author by two books that he wrote very late in a long career, and he might have been losing a step. Might have, that I wasn't judging him by his best work, in other words. That bugged me and sent me looking. It sent me a prospecting for earlier Nelson Nye to read. Uh, but the, the other claim that Michael K. Vaughan makes about Nelson Nye and the passage that he reads, which is hysterically overwritten, just it's, it's an eight-year-old boy's idea of a, a rootin' tootin' uh, hop-along Cassidy Western story. It's, it, it, it's for that. No one... I firmly believe that the loyalty this this author engendered in Michael K. Vaughan was engendered around that age, which would make perfect sense. But it, coming to it as an adult, the second defense that, that Michael K. Vaughan launches for Nelson Nye is that he intentionally wrote poorly, <laughs> that he did that intentionally to ape an existing style. Uh, we'll, we'll pass on until my summation to the jury. We'll move on to author number three, an author who needs no introduction on this channel, and that is Stephen King. I'm well known for my dislike of Stephen King. It is a considered dislike. It is not, as Michael K. Vaughan implies in his video, a reflex. It is not a reflex, but we'll get to that. Uh, he, he says, this, this author is enormously popular. So who are you going to listen to? That popularity or some snooty, snobby critic? Now, I want to point out here uh, that I mean, this, is all, this is all in good fun. But I defy anyone to apply the term snooty or snobby to me as a critic. I defy anyone to do that. And the implication, the third implication, the snooty and snobby, then there's a third implication of something else, and that bothers me even more, and that's that, that critics get inflexibly closed-minded. Well, you know, 20 years ago, I pronounced author X bad, so author X will always be bad for me. I'll never give them a fair shake. I have given Stephen King more fair shakes than I have hairs on my head. I go into almost every novel of his with a wide open mind and wanting to like him. Of course, he's a cultural phenomenon. He is, as Michael K. Vaughan points out, extremely popular. You think I don't want to like something like that? Do you think, I mean, how many people were induced to read just in general because of Stephen King? I've said this many times about this author, that that has to be an unalloyed good on the credit side of his ledger, is that he has made readers by the thousands, maybe by the millions. That's no small feat, especially since most of those readers have been men. I, I, I give him all credit for that. But uh, <laughs> that's popularity, which is done through word of mouth. It's done through handing things on to your younger brother. It's done through the only book that was at the summer camp or the summer rental. It's, it's through penetration of the market. It's through movies. It's, those are different things than anything that a critic would really be, have the remit to talk about. But Michael K. Vaughan says, if book critics have been so spectacularly wrong in these cases, why should I listen to them? It's actually not a bad question. And there's, there are three points that I want to make in response. And point number one is something I just alluded to, which is popularity and longevity in print aren't the same thing as literary quality. A critic can say about... What's the matter, baby? Do you want to come down here? Well, I'm just ranting, baby. You can come down on the couch. There you go. Uh, a critic can point out uh, in 1930 that author X, Y, or Z is writing really sloppy prose, has really poorly constructed plots, uh, ha has uh, imports a huge amount of unapologetic misogyny into those plots when writers right around that author all throughout that same period were not doing that, and that those are legitimate demerits to the worth of the book legitimate demerits to the objective estimate of the book. Those objective estimates can still be right, whether the book takes off or not, whether the book is read 100 years from, uh, from then or not, whether the book sells a million copies or not. Those, those 
critical estimates of what's going on inside the book don't have anything to do with market popularity or with the longevity of a title, how long it's around. So that's point number one that I want to make, is that if you're going to criticize somebody, if, if you're going to criticize critics as being snooty and snobby and inflexibly judgmental and presumably out of touch, you should criticize them for what they are supposed to do instead of for what they're not, right? I mean, you don't, if a guy is fixing your carburetor in, in, at the local garage, you don't attack him for his high jump, <laughs> right? So but anyway, that's point number one. Uh, point number two that I want to make uh, reflects back on all three writers, H.P. Lovecraft, Nelson Nye, and Stephen King. And that is that the critics weren't wrong about them. <laughs> the critics who prevailed them, who criticized them for their flaws, there are plenty of them in all three of these writers, I would say far more in the latter two than in Lovecraft. Uh, the critics who, who pointed out the flaws in their technical performance as writers were right. They weren't wrong. So when, when Michael K. Vaughan says critics are all completely wrong about these three writers, if critics have been so spectacularly wrong in these cases, why should I listen to them? They weren't wrong in these cases. What we're butting up against here, I think, is a the age-old divide that we talk about on this channel all the time, as necessarily we would, since this is a channel by a critic. And that is that those technical estimations, those technical criticisms of how a book does what it does, don't have anything to do with whether or not you like that book. You can like that book all you like. No, self, no good critic will ever cross that line. No good critic will ever say, here's all the things that this book is doing wrong, and therefore you shouldn't like it. Most critics that I've known, going back a long, long time, would say, here are all the things this book is doing wrong. And if you like it, that's great. That's fantastic. We, you, you're fantastic. More power to you. And more power to the author. If despite those technical failings, the author can still amass a huge audience, more power to them. I might feel a bit of frustration when it comes to an author I think as self-evidently horrible as Stephen King. And I don't say that because I read different seasons 50 years ago and decided on that opinion and just have lazily stuck to it. I've given this fraud as many chances at bat as I've given any author, alive or dead. I'm constantly trying to like this author. He even went so far as to write a gigantic book, which I love, on the Kennedy assassination, which I love. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, my point, my second point is that the, the critics weren't wrong about these authors. The, the flaws that their smarter critics pointed out and have pointed out over the decades are there. Well, that's the critic's job. Do you create good characters? Is this, this ending predictable if a character's losing weight a little bit more every chapter, chapter after chapter after chapter? Is it possible that I know on page 10 that at the end the characters are simply going to float away? Yeah. If I know that on page 10, that's probably bad. <laughs> it's probably a bad, hackneyed, cliched premise. And on and on and on. You, you create a really convincing villain in the first 800 pages of your book, and then they just fritter away to nothing in the last 200 pages? There, Despite Stephen King's popularity, there are a whole array of completely legitimate criticisms to be leveled against, for instance, The Stand. And, you know, don't start, you King dude bros, don't start with, oh, you got to read the Underbridge version, man. <laughs> you think I haven't read? <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's point number two, is that the critics' criticisms were right. And then point number three is my answer. Uh, to Michael K. Vaughan's question. Michael K. Vaughan actually does answer his own question in his video, Do We Even Need Book Critics? After kicking them around the block a few times, he says, yeah, we, we probably do need professional book critics. But my God, when you watch his video, and you should, <laughs> it's at a thousand views, I think now it should be well over that. When you watch his video, ask yourself, take a step back, no matter what you think about professional critics, take a step back and ask yourself, would you want to be liked? Would you want to be needed? in the kind of deformed, two-headed calf at the county fair way that he describes in his video? Would you want to be needed in that way? <laughs> As a, in, in the way of, well, you know, we're all going out living our, our best lives. We're over in the corner. you got those professional book critics, and we don't want to exterminate them or anything, even though they're completely useless and wrong all the time and two-headed. We still don't want to get rid of them. I, I'm not sure that anybody would want to be needed in that way, but at least grudgingly. At the end of his video, Michael K. Vaughan does arrive at the semi-conclusion that he, maybe we do need professional book critics. Uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that book, professional book critics are paid. Uh, I, I don't 
I don't put any emphasis on that myself. You're either if you're doing something a job in public, it doesn't matter whether or not you're being paid. If you're a, if you're a legitimate person, you'll do your best work no matter what. The pay won't matter, especially since when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to freelance book reviewing, when you're not part of an actual organization, but you're just doing freelance to editors here, there, and everywhere. Uh, the paid part it can sometimes be nominal at best. <laughs> What's the kind of stress there? You're not exactly raking in the doubloons. But he puts a lot of stress on that that I don't think is is worth it. Michael, The first thought that came to my mind when he kept insisting on that was Michael K. Vaughn's own booktube channel, which is absolutely terrific and for which he is not paid. So we'll leave that, we'll leave that aside. And we'll leave aside for a minute the, the petting zoo kind of need that, that he that he mentions in his video. He also mentions that the professional book critic is a wide reader a, responsible for a wide readership. I myself have a wide readership, about, I'd say, probably 275,000 readers uh, all over the world that I have garnered through m appearing in many journals in many places. Where, you know, as you know, probably, if a, if a reviewer strikes a chord with you, think you can trust them, or best yet, if you take their recommendations and those recommendations pan out, you're going to follow that reviewer wherever they go. I've had a lot of people do that over the years, so I have a fairly big readership. Uh, Michael K. Vaughan points out that if you're being paid and you're you're doing a professional job and you've got a readership that you're responsible for, then you know you'll be doing your best work. I might add to that that if you're a critic for a long time, you will get really good at criticism. You'll get really good at assessing something critically. I don't know why we give a free pass to books alone of all other things. I haven't studied the comments on Michael's video, but I guarantee you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I bet you my last Boston cream pie, that a few of those comments haul out that horrible old bugbear. Well, it's all subjective anyway. <laughs> uh, which incenses me and is obviously not true. And why would it be true about writing as opposed to anything else? <laughs> Writing's a task that humans set themselves. Like trapeze artistry, or composing a sonnet, or a concertina. It, it, when humans set themselves a task, and they have to learn it, it's not instinctive, and they have to practice at it, we routinely judge the end results in everything except writing, where all of a sudden people say, oh, it's all subjective anyway. And I believe that the reason they do that is because of that divide between a critic criticizing something on technical grounds, critical grounds, and you liking that something. Way too many people feel threatened if someone calls the thing they like technically bad. They shouldn't. No self-respecting critic should ever touch whether or not you like something, just whether or not it's successfully done. Where it's weak, where it's strong, what balls it drops. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That doesn't touch on whether or not you like it. I like a lot of garbage. A lot of it. As I've shown you on this channel over the years, I think a lot of critics are like that. The ones who aren't, ooh, I have no more patience with them than anybody does. Uh, but my my third point here is to answer Michael K. Vaughan, the question that animates Michael K. Vaughan's video, do we need professional book critics? I want to say uh, two things, yes and no. <laughs> One, no. We don't need professional book critics, just like we don't need 99.9% .9 of all jobs including yours. <laughs> Unless you have, a, you have a job that's on a very short list, you don't have a job that anybody needs. <laughs> Why are we suddenly putting that unreasonable burden on the tiny handful of people? They'd fit in this room. They've actually fit in this room. Who, who write book reviews professionally? Why are we putting that burden on them when we don't put it on a whole bunch of other people, including you? I guarantee you, if, if we pulled down your boxer shorts, then stitched on the back would be the word redundant. Apply to you, by your mama, <laughs> because most people, we don't need their jobs. <laughs> so that's the, the no part. We don't need professional book critics. You certainly don't need a professional book critic when it, if we wobble that line and say you're looking for someone to tell you what to like. You'll like what you like, and that's sacrosanct, absolutely inviolable. You do need a professional book critic, though. The yes part of it is that professional book critics read a lot more than most people do, and they bring that experience to bear. I don't know why we're, we're singling out book critics. I, people look at movie reviews before they go to try a movie. Plenty of times they do. And they don't just look at the customer reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. They look at what the critics are saying. And why? 
because the customer is bringing all sorts of unexamined baggage. They're not reviewing something critically, just like all the people that Michael K. Vaughn uh, alludes to in his video. People leaving so-called reviews on Goodreads or Amazon or whatever, when it's mostly just, did you like it or didn't you? With no real criticism. I, I don't know, it just didn't, it didn't do anything for me. That's not a review. It's your response, and I'm fascinated by it, but it's not a review. If we're going to criticize, again, if we're going to criticize professional book critics, let's at least criticize them for their own jobs, which is to do a whole lot more than a Yelp review. <laughs> it's a whole lot more than that. There's a whole lot more involved. And that's even before you get to the final part that most critics fail at, which is to take all of that more involved and transform it into a piece of writing that is entertaining in its own right. That's a skill. Like anything else, a book critic can be good or bad at it, but it's not. When a book critic is good at it, it is something that you can use. I'm not saying that you need it, but you can use it. <laughs> so uh, so th that's how I wanted to wrap things up here, is that there are three, the three points that I wanted to make. One, uh, that critics aren't talking about whether or not a book becomes popular, or lasts 100 years, or 200 years, or 1,000 years. They're talking about the book itself on the page, what it's doing and what it's not doing, what it's trying and what it's failing at. That's point number one. Uh, point number two is that the critics weren't, in fact, wrong about any of the three writers that Michael K. Vaughan gives as examples. I'd be hard-pressed to come up with an example that would, that would illustrate the point, but these three definitely don't. I can walk you through the ways in which Stephen King is a bad writer. I don't just say that and expect you to take it as gospel, any more with him than with, for instance, Cormac McCarthy, which is a case where I actually do walk you through how a book is bad. Now, you can still like it, but if you're going to tell me, like I, I walked, I walked years ago, I walked readers through *The Road* by Cormac McCarthy, which won the the Pulitzer Prize and is absolutely venerated by his fans. I walked people through that book probably what two hours total of video time, scene by scene, theme by theme, authorial tick by authorial tick. Now I got a lot of response from those videos, and some of that response was just tired old dude bros saying, "Well." Imagine thinking he's a bad writer. I, I want to say to those people, I'm not just imagining it. I'm taking you through it point by point. If you've got refutations, feel free to make them, but don't just assert that he's great and I'm missing it. <laughs> Same thing with Stephen King. If I wanted to, believe you me, pick the best book of his, the one that you think is technically the best one. I could rip it to shreds, except for the early books where he was actually edited. But the later stuff, oh my God, it's indefensible. And I don't just say that because I am a snooty, snobby critic who's inflexibly s stuck in that judgment and has been for decades. No, not at all. That would be a betrayal of my job, not me doing my job. Uh, and the, 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 other, the other point uh, is that you don't need a professional book critic to, to like something at all. But there is a legitimate, a whole legitimate aspect of reading books that is reading them critically. Professional book critics tend to be better at doing that than people who aren't professional book critics. There's no snobbery involved there. There's no condescension involved there. It's a skill. If you had a skill that you did every single day for decades, I wouldn't have the nerve to say that anyone could do it as well as you. No. Critically evaluating a book is a skill. If you're interested in reading a critical evaluation of a book, that's what you need a professional book critic for. I myself think that Michael K. Vaughan would make an excellent professional book critic. I think the writing tone of his criticism, if he were to do it, uh, would be a tone that isn't largely in evidence today it, it, uh, and is badly needed. I think his reviews would be popular. They'd be snapped up. Uh, but would he have to delete this video? <laughs> or does he want to become a two-headed calf in the despised dark corner of the petting zoo? <laughs> anyway, I, of course, couldn't let a video called Do We Even Need Book Critics go without a response. That's my response. You don't need me, but you want me. <laughs> so anyway, I'll leave a link to Michael's video, and I will wrap this up before I go on for another hour. But I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.